reaction uh, to the word that, uh, that Steve Bannon, the man you spoke to on the phone, is now officially out? Well, I'm, I'm stunned. Uh, I think, as, as your panel indicated, he was pretty much on the ropes before this happened, so maybe this was the last straw. But, you know, the Greeks used to say that character is fate. And uh, he's been displaying a kind of recklessness, a kind of freelancing that put him on very thin ice. And I think it was only a matter of time. And the, the recklessness fully on display in the conversation with me, not just in terms of what he said about his colleagues, about his boss, about himself, but in terms of just neglecting to even say whether we were on the record or off the record. And this is not a rookie. I mean, it was a rookie error by one of the savviest media operators in the country, in the world. What was the most reckless thing uh, uh, that you recall uh, Steve Bannon saying about the president of the United States in that interview you had with him? Well, I think directly contradicting uh, the president's view on Korea, that was pretty reckless. Uh, I think uh, going into great detail about the infighting, uh, who he was going to get fired by name. Uh, her, her job is probably as safe as anybody's job in America right now. And um, the, the fact that, you know, he had, he had problems with, with Gary Cohn. I mean, it, it was like he was taking on everybody all at once. And I think the other thing that was reckless was his assumption that because he and I happened to have a convergent critique of America-China policy, that I would somehow look the other way, being the editor of a liberal magazine, American Prospect, that I would somehow look the other way at all of the racism, all of the xenophobia that he's been the architect of, and, and that he could somehow um, BS his way into saying, all oh, those people are a bunch of clowns. I mean, the things that he said about his own allies were, were pretty reckless. And I think, the uh, look, the assumption that he's going to build a grand left-right coalition for a different trade policy on China, and there have been liberal critics, I think for very good reason, I'm one of them, of, of the fact that we're letting China to take a check to the cleaners with, with American industry. Uh, but the assumption that you could, you could build a, a grand left-right alliance that would change this policy, I mean, think about it. You can just imagine Steve Bannon going into a meeting of U.S. Trade Rep or Defense Department or, or National Security Council and saying, all right, Here's the game plan. We're going to change our whole China policy. And by the way, I've got Bob Kuttner on my side. And that doesn't exactly enhance his credibility at the Trump White House. Yeah, I, and on North Korea, uh, the, the interview occurred after the president said fire and fury, after the president said the U.S. military was locked and loaded. And in the interview with you, he said, uh, this, this is Steve Bannon, there's no military solution to North Korea's nuclear threats. Forget it. Until somebody solves the part of the equation that shows me that 10 million people in Seoul don't die in the first 30 minutes from conventional weapons, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no military solution here. They got us. That is in total contradiction to what the president was suggesting in the days leading up to that interview. That must have so startled you to hear that from Steve Bannon. Not only did it startle me, but it was also a lot saner as policy than the president's own view. So, one, well, one question I have that uh, I think was implicit in the discussion before you brought me in, um, Trump is famous for having back-channel conversations with anybody and everybody in his circle. So even if Trump is forced out as the official political strategist, is Trump going to continue to have back-channel conversations with him? Because Bannon is the architect of the strategy of getting into bed with the far right. Uh, ever since initial events in Charlottesville, Trump has been doubling down on that, I would assume, with, with Bannon's encouragement, or, or if not explicit encouragement, Bannon's fingerprints are on that. What does he do now with Bannon out with this strategy of becoming more and more reckless himself about stoking up the neo-Nazi right? What's that going to be like without Bannon there to hold his hand and walk him through it? Or is Bannon still going to be there at the end of a phone? Because there are several people who have been fired uh, or have resigned from uh, this president, either during the campaign or since he became president. And the president still maintains, you're absolutely right, that back-channel communication. And so you suspect that, that the communication with Steve Bannon will continue, even though he is out officially from the White House. 
Well, I think it makes the White House itself more chaotic, but uh, it also means that Trump is even more reliant on all of these back channels. And I think the man of the hour is General Kelly. I mean, what is he going to do? If if he had not succeeded in, uh, in forcing Trump out, it would have shown that he's impotent. So now we know that he has some power, but does he have enough power given all of the propensities of the president? You know what, I, I want to just play for you, uh, Bob, what the president of the United States in that off-the-rails news conference he had Tuesday in the lobby at Trump Tower, he was asked about Steve Bannon's future, uh, and his words were pretty precise. Listen to this. Look, I like Mr. Bannon. He's a friend of mine. But Mr. Bannon came on very late. You know that. I went through 17 senators, governors, and I won all the primaries. Mr. Bannon came on very much later than that. Uh, and I like him. He's a good man. He is not a racist. I can tell you that. He's a good person. He actually gets a very unfair press in that regard. But we'll see what happens with Mr. Bannon. But he's a good person, and I think the press treats him, frankly, very unfairly. We'll see what happens. Uh, and our Jim Acosta, our senior White House correspondent, Bob, is reporting that Bannon was supposed to be fired two weeks ago. That, according to a White House official, but that firing was put off. Uh, but go ahead and react. I wonder what you thought when you heard the president say, we'll see what happens, Steve Bannon, because that's, to me, that was a sign he's gone. Yeah, and it's even more uh, vivid in hindsight. That's what you say when you got, you're about to give somebody a gold watch. Uh, Bob Kuttner, uh, th thanks so much for joining us. Uh, he's the uh, co-editor of The American Prospect. He did that very, very important interview the other day with Steve Bannon. And that interview, uh, by all accounts, Bob, uh, I'm sure had a role to play in the decision today uh, that Steve Bannon is no longer the, st uh, the senior strategic advisor to the president of the United States. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. You know, when, when the president said, John King, that uh, we'll see what happens, we knew what was going to happen. We, we did. I just want to quickly say I read Bob Kuttner for 20 years plus years now, one of the more thoughtful people in the progressive movement, even if you're a conservative, especially on economic policy, uh, that, that he's in the middle of this, given the liberal American prospect, talking to the alt-right Steve Bannon, the ironies, Washington is a very different place in this environment. But to the point to that sound you just played from the president, this is part of the issue and part of the question. It goes well beyond Steve Bannon. He's asked about Steve Bannon. And he's, essentially, the president says, I did this. He came on late in the campaign. Uh, it's always about the campaign. He's been president of the United States for seven months. He has zero significant legislative achievements. None of his signature campaign promises have made it to the finish line. And you ask him a question about something that's going on in his White House, and it's always back to the campaign. Uh, this is the fundamental problem of the Trump presidency. Not who's the chief of staff and who's the chief strategist. That is not to understate the drama of this moment and the significance of somebody as larger, or actually a larger than life figure, of Steve Bannon being shown the door. But the new chief of staff, maybe he picks a new strategist. Maybe he works with the president on that. It's not about the personnel. It's about the president. Uh, and and the, every answer goes back to the campaign. The campaign's over. He's president. Obamacare is still the law of the land. Tax reform is nowhere. He had an event the other day that dissolved into what you just played us there that was supposed to be an infra infrastructure. That plan doesn't even exist. I do wonder at some point, I know the Trump voters are incredibly personal and loyal to this president. At some point, they're good people. They're common sense people. They can do the math. They're going to ask, what happened? To, I'm going to run it like a business. What happened to Washington is stupid, and I know how to fix it. Uh, where is that? Uh, to Bob's other point about the outside circle of advisors, I think he raises a key question because the president does still talk. Corey Lewandowski from the campaign, to Dave Bossy from the campaign. Uh, now will Steve Bannon get added to that list? I think it's a fair question. You know, he's presumably, I don't know if he will, uh, but he was one of the leaders of Breitbart, uh, which uh, uh, is reacting. And I want to show you, want to show our viewers a tweet uh, that just came out uh, by one of the senior editors, one of the top, uh, top uh, writers at Breitbart from Joel Pollack. Uh, you see that hashtag war, hashtag war. Uh, that is a, a pretty strong statement. Point, doesn't it? I, one of the biggest questions I've had as we kind of wonder when, not if, but when Steve Bannon would be out of this White House, is how the conservative media will respond, and particularly Breitbart, which is some, a, a place that's been promotional of this president. What will they do? Will you see them start to turn on Trump? And I think that Joel's tweet there says the answer is undoubtedly yes. He's not going to have a soft landing in these places because the, Steve Bannon is one of their own. He has been rejected. 
and they now feel isolated and they feel like this is a president they boosted, they and their, their ilk boosted, and now they're being tossed out of the inner circle and they don't seem to like it. And this was always the danger of bringing in Bam, right? I mean, the, the, that it would end in this way almost inevitably, but that the outcome there when you do that with someone with the ties that he has to Breitbart and into the broader uh, movement there is that this happens and that they turn on you. Uh, one thing I'll say, and I, I keep coming back to and John's made this point, is Donald Trump is the only advisor that matters in the White House. If you've learned anything, if, I guess if I've learned anything in seven months of this presidency, it's, it's that. It's that John Kelly has said privately, semi-publicly, I'm focusing on the of staff part. That we're going to try and get the staff in order. Departures, uh, Anthony Scaramucci, though, sort of departed himself, uh, and Steve Bannon. Makes some sense. But the... the the central guy, the guy who's not going to disappear from any pictures in the Oval Office, is Donald Trump. Uh, theoretically, could Mike Pence have some influence on him? Sh sure, though Mike Pence has been his most ardent, steady defender, even as it related to Charlottesville and his comments there, or lack thereof. So. What's difficult is we debate all this stuff. I don't think it is beneficial of Donald Trump to have Breitbart on the outside, to have Bannon on the outside. At the same time, you know, there's a lot of Bannon's views in Donald Trump, whether they were there, whether Bannon cultivated them. Regardless, there's a lot of Steve Bannon in the one guy that we know who matters in the White House. And you know, what was, what was significant was that as we speak right now, the president's at Camp David with a couple dozen uh, of his top advisors, cabinet officials, national security officials. And when the White House earlier today released the list of who was participating to discuss the future of Afghanistan and other critically important issues, Steve Bannon's name was not there. No, it's a uh, principals meeting in the National Security Council. And you recall, this was a controversy was at the very once. beginning of the administration. He was once on that and then removed from it. Uh, had this meeting taken place at the beginning of this administration, Steve Bannon would have been there. The Breitbart reporter for the White House, Charlie Spearing, uh, his tweet uh, along the lines of what you just showed, and kids, that's the day when Bannon the Barbarian was born. Uh, that, and and I, whether or not that that power that Bannon might have on the outside is going to be aimed at Donald Trump, or to John King's point earlier, more aimed at Jared Kushner, yep. Ivanka, Gary Cohn, Dina Powell, the globalists in uh, in the mind of uh, Bannon. Uh, you know, I, I don't I know that John Kelly be, too. I don't know that it'll be directly aimed at the president. But if you're around the president and considered uh, anathema to the Bannon worldview, uh, I would watch out. Like you're going to have some you know, coming. John, your way. let's not forget the the week that this is all taking place. What happened this week? Uh, an amazing historic week. The reaction of the president to the to the disaster, uh, to the tragedy that occurred in Charlottesville. Virginia uh, and culminating with a whole bunch of Republicans strongly condemning the President of the United States, including Mitt Romney, uh, only today issuing a statement whether he intended to or not. What he, the President, communicated caused racists to rejoice, minorities to weep, and the vast heart of America to mourn. Make a key point, the President of the United States. I think that's been the recurring theme here. Uh, you can change personnel, and maybe this is necessary. The President, this will give some moderate Republicans especially who view Steve, who have viewed Steve Bannon as toxic from day one and who maybe don't like to go out and criticize the President who are getting asked about what he said Tuesday, the moral equivalency of the counter-demonstrators to the KKK and the neo-Nazis. It'll give them to say, well, this is a positive change by the President. But, but it is the President. It is the President. Uh, and with this further fracturing, Breitbart is now at war. Uh, Breitbart was on his side for the first seven months, right? Does, if you further fracture the conservative Republican, what you want to call a conversation, does that help you or hurt you when you're trying to get votes for Obamacare? I would argue it hurts if you're in this mess. Does it help or hurt when the conservatives come back next week and say, we're not going to vote to raise the debt ceiling unless we get offsetting spending cuts? A recurring drama we've heard throughout Republican years in Washington, but now you have a Republican president. So administration that has zero significant legislative achievements before you now is in a more messy environment even on its side, the part that it has been able to keep together. The Trump base has been solid. His other poll numbers are terrible. The Trump base has been relatively solid from day one. Does this impact that? The question mark. But if it does, it further hurts a president who is deeply and profoundly wounded right Just now. Just by the way, one quick thing. I mean, it, there's so much news every week, it's hard to remember all. John is 100% right. Let me just add other attacking Mitch McConnell repeatedly, the Senate Majority Leader last week. Uh, 
tweeting out his support for Kelly Ward, a primary challenger to a sitting incumbent, attacking Lindsey Graham, uh, another sitting incumbent. This is not the way for someone who has no legislative accomplishments, for someone who we really don't know ideologically what the way forward is, and we certainly don't know legislatively what the way forward is. It's easy to say, we're on to tax reform. Well, what and how? Uh, presidents who are much more legislatively versed than Donald Trump have failed at that. Right. You also have the fact that this is someone, I forgot to mention, Lisa Murkowski, Ben Sass, Susan Collins. Uh, uh, there are a lot of senators who Donald Trump has insulted in literally the last three weeks, much less since he's been in office, yeah. uh, that he's going to theoretically need if he's going to do anything, and they're not going to be for him, even whether Steve Bannon works there or doesn't work. I'm going to try to do it despite him, not for him. Yeah. Ryan Streeb is gone. Uh, uh, Anthony Scaramucci, how long did he last? Not very long. Uh, gone. Ten full days. Sean Spicer, gone. Now Steve Bannon, gone from the White House. Uh, the exodus continues. Our special coverage resumes right after a quick break. All right, John Berman here, the breaking news. A manhunt gripping a nation after a terror attack spreads into an attempted terror wave. 14 people now confirmed dead in assaults targeting first Barcelona, then a coastal town 75 miles away. Police say the events are related. First to Barcelona, where a van careened through a busy tourist location, killing more than a dozen, injuring more than 100. The driver of that van is on the loose. And early this morning, down the coast, five armed attackers were killed in a shootout with police. Officials not providing many details about the incident other than six bystanders were injured too seriously along with one police officer four other suspects now in custody these incidents follow a house explosion that left one person dead police now working on the theory that the two attacks were being prepared in that house melissa bell joins me now from barcelona melissa what's the latest That's right, John. This investigation is, of course, moving extremely quickly. And we've just now been hearing from the head of Catalonia's uh, police service about that explosion that you mentioned in the town of Alcanar outside of Barcelona. This, this was an explosion that happened not last night here in Spain, but the night before, Wednesday night. So even before that deadly rampage down Las, Las Rambas here in uh, Barcelona, an explosion in a house that killed one Spanish national Police had also made it clear afterwards that a couple of arrests had been made in the wake of the attack here in Barcelona and that one of those arrests was also linked to that house in Alcanar. So that house had obviously been a question, an important part of this puzzle as we try to piece together uh, what precisely went, here, went on here in Spain over the course of the last few days. What police have just confirmed is that they believe that that house was in fact where bombs were being created in uh, the preparation of one or several attacks that were being planned in or around Barcelona. Then, of course, after the explosion in that house, we had the deadly events here of Barcelona last night, immediately followed within a few hours by those events in Cambril. So uh, three very separate incidents, but that are clearly linked now with a great deal of focus on precisely who was in that house in Alcanar, who else might have been involved, and what precisely we know about that man who was arrested in connection with that house in Alcanar. That house is now proving crucial to the investigation as it progresses. All right, a manhunt, as we said, underway. New information about the vast connections here. We'll have much more on this coming up. Melissa Bell, thank you very, very much. And we will get to the president's response, President Trump's response to Barcelona in just a moment. His response has set off some pretty serious honesty alarm bells. But first, a new response, arresting in many ways, from the mother of Heather Heyer, the woman killed in Charlottesville. Moments ago, Susan Bro levied a direct and blistering message to the president. Listen to this. We understand that President Trump has reached out. Have you talked to him directly yet? Um, I have not, and now I will not. Um, at first, I just missed his calls. Uh, the, call act the first call, it looked like, actually came during the funeral. Um, I didn't even see that message. There were three more frantic messages from press secretaries throughout the day, and I didn't know why that would have been on Wednesday. And I was home recovering from the exhaustion of the funeral. And um, so I thought, well, I'll get to him later. And then I had more meetings uh, to establish her foundation. So I hadn't really watched the news until last night. 
And I'm I'm not talking to the president now. I'm sorry. What After did you what he said about my child, and it's not that I saw somebody else's tweets about him. I saw an actual clip of him at a press conference equating the protesters, like Miss Hire, uh, with the KKK and the white supremacists. And that is where you are right now because after his statement, after he read his statement on Monday, you thanked him, but now you've had a chance to hear his remarks from Tuesday, and that has changed your position as far as the president is concerned and wanting to, to hear from him. Absolutely. You can't wash this one away by shaking my hand and saying I'm sorry. Is there something though that I'm you not forgiving for that? Not is there something though that you would want to say to the president? Think before you speak. All right. Wow. And you will remember the president was uh, gushing with praise of Heather Heyer's mother just days ago. CNN's Athena Jones live in New Jersey, not far from the president's golf resort. There, Athena. That was a, a very emotional and some ways stunning response from the mother of Heather Heyer. Uh, any word from the White House yet? Hi, John. No, I reached out to a couple of White House officials in the last hour to try to get a response uh, to Susan Bro's comments. Uh, I haven't received any response so far, but I think what's notable is what we heard, uh, not just throughout what that, that, that exchange there, but also at the end when she said to the president, I think before you speak. And I think that's one of the central concerns of the president's critics. Uh, they believe that he is thinking uh, before he's speaking and tweeting, uh, that he's speaking and tweeting his real, true thoughts. Uh, the thoughts that he shared on Saturday that got so much criticism when he talked about it on many sides, and then the thoughts that he shared, again, not teleprompter aided, on Tuesday uh, when, he, when he had that, that, that stunning back and forth at Trump Tower. Uh, let's remind, you mentioned that the president had some glowing words to say about Susan Bro. Uh, at that press conference. Let's play a little bit of that. Her mother wrote me and said through, I guess, Twitter, social media, the nicest things, and I very much appreciated that. I hear she was a fine, really actually an incredible young woman, but her mother on Twitter thanked me for what I said. So there you heard the president uh, uh, celebrating this, this comment that he's got, that he'd gotten from Susan Bro's mother. But remember, that was after the Monday remarks, the teleprompter-aided remarks in which he condemned the KKK, neo-Nazis, and white supremacists by name. Uh, that is when Susan Bro wrote uh, saying that she thanked him for his words of comfort. But that was undone by his remarks on Tuesday, Don. And that is what uh, she was just responding to there on GMA, on Good Morning, Good Morning America. Can't wash away what he said, says Susan Bro with a handshake. Again, uh, emotional words there. Some surprising words also overnight, Athena, from at a minimum a family which has been extremely supportive of the President of the United States, from James Murdoch, the CEO of 21st Century Fox, as in Fox News. Explain. Absolutely. We're talking about Rupert Murdoch's son. That Rupert Murdoch is one of the president's allies and friends, someone he speaks to frequently. And, of course, Fox, uh, one of the networks he likes to watch. This is what James Murdoch said. Uh, I'll just read you some excerpts. He said, what we watched this last week in Charlottesville and the reaction to it by the president of the United States concerns all of us as Americans and free people. He, wanted, he went on to say, I can't even believe I have to write this. Standing up to Nazis is essential. There are no good Nazis. Uh, so a very strong reaction from one of the president's uh, you know, allies in the media uh, and that emotional reaction from Heather Heyer's mother. And this goes follows uh, an increasing number of Republicans who are calling out the president. We saw uh, yesterday Tennessee Senator Bob Corker, who has not been a, a big critic of the president, uh, questioning his stability and his competence. So this is this is a serious time here, John. All right, uh, Athena Jones, as we've been saying, the island getting smaller, the support network for the president dwindling by the day here. All right, Athena Jones in New Jersey, thanks so much. Joining me now, CNN politics reporter Eugene Scott, CNN political analyst Andy Parnes, and Patrick Healy. Eugene, first to you, because you've been doing some reporting uh, on the comments this morning from Susan Bro. Again, 
very emotional. I mean, this comes from the mother of the woman who was killed, standing up for what she believed in, who flat out says she will not even speak to the president. And in her opinion, the president was equating her daughter with the white supremacists and neo-Nazis that were marching. Indeed. I took away two things from her interview. One, she was offended by the insensitivity of the White House in trying to reach her during the funeral and during the moments after the funeral, which were a very personal and exhausting time for her, as she said. But something that's also very important is many Trump surrogates have said that the president was clear. He was very clear in condemning white supremacy in his words. What she heard, what Susan Bro heard, was the president equating these white supremacists with the activists, her daughter included. So I think it just exemplified just how much the White House and President Donald Trump in particular have not addressed this issue in ways where all Americans know where he clearly stands. It's a very good point. That is what Susan Bro heard. It is what James Murdoch heard. It's what Bob Corker, Republican senator from Tennessee, we heard Athena Jones talking about that before. He's the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's not a bomb thrower but by any stretch of the imagination. He was on the short list to be Secretary of State. Listen to what Bob Corker said. The president has not, yet, um, has not yet been able to demonstrate the stability uh, nor some of the competence that he needs to demonstrate in order to be successful. His comments on Tuesday started erasing the comments that were strong. What we want to see from our president is clarity and moral authority, and that moral authority is compromised when Tuesday happens. There's no question about that. We also heard from Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina there, Amy Parnes. And just take a step back here. I don't want people to lose the big picture here, the scope, the breadth of the people coming out against what the president said now. Moments ago, it now includes the mother of Heather Heyer, but James Murdoch overnight, Senator Bob Corker, charities. Right. You have charity groups like the Cleveland Clinic and the American Cancer Society pulling out of events at Mar-a-Lago. All these people want to do is raise money to cure cancer. Now they're not even willing to do it at a Trump establishment. Right, the chips are starting to fall. You see the business community, you see lawmakers. I'm hearing from sources every day who say this is acceptable. The drumbeat is getting worse. You know, it started with North Korea last week. It was the cops comment a couple of weeks ago that really got some people really frustrated and wound up. They're kind of fed up at this point with their president. And I think when Congress comes back into session, you're going to start hearing a lot more of that. You're going to start seeing people say, OK, this is not acceptable. You need to start taking it very seriously. You need to start implementing some stability so Americans feel more secure. It's very interesting. Bob Corker there used the word stability. The opposite of stability is instability there. So there are incredibly loaded words from the senator. Tim Scott used another phrase, Patrick Healy, moral authority, which in some ways might be the most powerful uh, you know, thing, weapon that the president yields. And if that moral authority is weakened, he or she is not left with very much. It's so true, John. I mean, these are the moments you know, in, in America's history and, and when, when we look to the president sometimes to really clarify what is, what is going on, what is happening in the country. I'm sure Tim Scott, being from South Carolina, remembers very much President Obama's speech uh, in Charleston after the shootings at the, at the memorial there. I, it, these are sort of, these are moments when presidents sort of reveal themselves and prove themselves. They're not actors, John, but they're people who look into the country, look into the country, what it's feeling, sort of the emotional, the psychological damage that these moments have and is able to bring people together. And what President Trump did in this really, like, first big opportunity, he, he zigged and zagged, he made, he, he equated different groups, he sort of spread blame around in a way that I think people, frankly, on, on all sides were, were just so baffled by. Eugene Scott, I want to go back to you on an issue here that is key, because what we saw from the president yesterday was an attempt to turn this issue from his comments saying that very fine people were there marching alongside the neo-Nazis and white supremacists to the debate, which has been going on for an awfully long time, about Confederate symbols and Confederate monuments. There are some people who will say that is a safer debate politically than a debate over whether there are good people who march with Nazis. However, you make the case that this is all one continuing slope in the issue of identity politics, which is an arena where the president likes to play. It is true. I mean, there is this thought that identity politics is this topic that is exclusive to the left. And the reality is that's just not true. 
what the president display his opinions on Confederate statues are the, the same values that many of his white working class voters in rural spaces feel about Confederate statues and the Confederate legacy as a whole. I think the challenge that he and his team are going to have to ask themselves, and I think Bob Corker and Tim Scott were getting to this a bit, is will playing into the identity politics of these white working class voters who have these uh, reverent views of Confederate statues hurt him with black and brown voters, a demographic that the Republican Party has struggled with for years, and in recent years, before Trump, has really tried to win. It was low already. I mean, you can't lose much some support from where he was on that. All right, Amy, another event that happened overnight, we were talking about the Barcelona attacks. One of the president's first responses to these attacks was to put out this statement. I call it an official statement. He put it out on Twitter, where he suggested people look at what he called the record of General Pershing. I'm going to play you some sound of what the president said about the same thing a little more than a year ago. Listen to this. And he dipped 50 bullets in pig's blood. And he had his men load his rifles. And he lined up the 50 people. And they shot 49 of those people. And the 50th person. He said, you go back to your people and you tell them what happened. And for 25 years, there wasn't a problem. Amy, three things here. Number one, historians will tell you that never happened. So right. the president, as president over the last 24 hours, spreading what appears to be a lie. Number two, as president, if it, even if it did happen, he'd be endorsing war crimes. Right. You know, and, and number three, there's no proof that General Pershing's actions were even effective, whatever they were, right. in fighting Muslim extremism in the Philippines during that time. All that aside, what this shows is the president acting in a way. Again, we talk about moral authority right here. People look to presidents, especially in times of terror attacks, for how they respond. What does this tell them about how he responds? Well, it, it kind of reflects this instability, as we talked about. You know, people were looking at him. His first tweet yesterday was, where you Stay strong. We're sending love. That's not sort of the sentiment that people needed right now, you know, as a country to kind of feel that. But then he went back and said, oh, no, you know, look at this. Uh, do follow this Pershing thing, which was completely, it's a fable. And so I think this kind of adds to that and fuels the fire of this instability that people are feeling and why lawmakers are coming out. And you'll see, as I said before, more and more of them, if he continues to make these remarks, Heather Heyer's mom came out today, it's not appropriate for this moment. It's maybe not even appropriate on the campaign trail, but particularly in the office of the president. All right, Patrick, Amy, you Thanks so much for being with us again. We do have breaking news this morning. The manhunt for the driver of a van who plowed through a crowd in Barcelona. Four arrested in these two attacks so far in Spain. We're on top of all the new developments. Plus, another controversial statue moved overnight.